James Aaron Toole made sure his six-year-old granddaughter Ashley safely boarded and disbarked her school bus every single day. That was 30 years ago. He was her guardian angel and her protector. And now Ashley returns the favor as she searches for her beloved grandfather who's been missing since 1995. And Profiling Evil is honored to share his story. Hey folks, I'm coming to you from London, England, where I'm visiting on business. This I was happy to investigate this case and provide whatever support I could to try to find James. Well, once I came to know his granddaughter, Ashley, I became personally invested. It was a beautiful day back in May of 1995 when James Toole climbed into his old pickup and began what was supposed to be a one-day trip to Florida where he intended on meeting family members. Now James, he was a little bit angry with his wife that day as he climbed into the truck. The two of them had been arguing. And some of the folks in town reported seeing James on that day, not unlike any other day when he was traveling around. He was driving in the community, again, just like every other day, but suddenly this well-known man disappeared, leaving his family and Pansley townsfolk wondering whatever happened to James Aaron Toole. The natural considerations included speculation that James had just got tired of things. He was mad at his wife that day. Maybe he ran off to start a new life, but it didn't seem likely. Others worried that he may have gone into the woods to commit suicide or that he stumbled into a bad situation and was murdered. With all the second guessing set aside, most people just flat wondered if James Toole had a terrible accident, perhaps even near water, and that he slipped away and out of eyesight. Now many folks are wondering if sinking below the surface would have explained how he vanished. And surely somebody would have stumbled across this guy's truck if he were just out in the woods. So, but one thing seemed evident, James planned to drive to Florida and that became the starting point for the searches that followed. And by way of clarification, I want to note that most of the footage in this video was created 10 months ago. And I want to thank Taylor Nicholas of TGI Crime Day for joining me on this discussion. Now, also joining me on the discussion, most importantly, I want to thank Ashley for reaching out and asking me to do James' story. I reached out to Adventures with Purpose and got permission to push this one out, even though they're going through some adjustments themselves right now. I hope you'll go over to TJI Crime Day and subscribe. The link's down below, and I think you'll enjoy listening to, to Taylor. And don't forget, hit that like and subscribe button on Profiling Evil. But Taylor, I wanna get started with an introduction, so if you could just tell us a little more about this case. Today's case is so interesting, and I'm really looking forward to hearing your theories about this, Mike. James Aaron Tool was 72 years old the last time his family saw him on May 15th, 1995. We were able to get some great insights from his granddaughters that really helped to paint a picture of the day he disappeared. James's wife, Anne, was staying with her daughter, Linda, for a couple of days. It seems like they had had some kind of an argument that led to Anne going to stay at her daughter's house. And on May 15th, James went to work his shift at a convenience store that was near their home, but he ended up leaving a few hours early. Then around 6 p.m., James went to talk to Anne, and their granddaughter heard them arguing, and then James left. He told his other granddaughter that he wouldn't be able to pick her up from the bus stop the following day because he needed to go to Florida for a few days to visit a sick family member. A few days passed, and nobody heard from James. So, of course, they followed up with their family in Florida, but none of them had heard from him, and they didn't even know that he planned to make a trip there. It's possible that he told his job he would be gone for a few days, but other than that, no one really knows where James went. There are volunteer dive teams that looked for James, and ground searches have been done over the years, but there has never been any sign of him or his car. Uh, Mike, what else can you tell us about James? Well, you know... I've got a couple of thoughts and a couple of things I found on him, but I want to make sure I clearly understand something. If we go back and look at the timeline on this, he receives a phone call at work. And in that phone call, 
something triggers him that tells him I got to leave work early. So that was kind of out of character for him. Is that kind of your assessment? I'm not sure if he got a phone call. I just know that he told his employer that he would need to leave a few hours early. And then he possibly, there were articles that said he did and articles that didn't say he did. He possibly told them that he would be gone for a few days. I'm not sure what the catalyst for that was. He left work a few hours early to go and talk to Anne. Um, but I don't know if there was a phone call that pushed him to do that. Okay, but but clearly there was a behavioral change because something happened at work that caused him to tell his employer, I got to leave early. And if this is correct, the information from the family was it wasn't a planned trip. So something changed and dramatically altered what his plans were. The, the other thing that was kind of interesting here is that you said that he and his wife were uh, arguing. Now, a 72-year-old man, this guy was born in Graceville, Florida, back in 1922. That's a long time ago. His mother and father, I found this kind of interesting. We're about 10 years apart in age, but it looks like they had a really good marriage and they did a good job of raising a family. But at age 19, when he was living in Cottondale, Florida, he joined the military and he served during World War II. Now, again, the greatest generation uh, by all accounts. After the war, this guy lands a job working at Paradise Fruit Company down in Florida, and he appears, at least it looks to me like he retired from there. But here's the thing that's kind of interesting. This is a guy that loved working, 72, and he's still working in convenience stores. So, you know, either they were not doing too well on the retirement money they had saved up, or he just liked working. We don't we don't know that for sure, but we do know there was something goofy going on with him and his wife because one of the reports that we read was that uh, she would from time to time go and stay with another family member when they were when they were mad at each other. Now, Mister Tool had a close relationship with one of his stepchildren and grandchildren. In fact, I think all of his stepchildren and grandchildren, but one granddaughter to this day, still refers to him as her best friend. And uh, and she kind of hung out with him a lot. Now, I guess I keep going back to this event that happened because when something like this happens that's out of the norm, you get a phone call that uh, somebody's health is declined and you got to hurry and get there if you want to see them before they die or something like that. That's when we see people make decisions, run out the door, forget to gas the car, forget to grab their eyeglasses. You know, they're so consumed with with the trauma of whatever they're facing. Uh, then he adds to that by going to try to talk to his wife, maybe asked her to come with him, but she won't even leave the bedroom and they kind of just separate and he goes on his way. Um, there's a lot to the dynamic in their relationship that I just wish we could learn a little bit more about, because I see mixed messages coming out of the reports, uh, at least those that I combed through. Number one was that Tool would drink alcohol from time to time. Now, some family members said the drinking wasn't in excess, but if she's angry and moving out of the house and other kinds of things, it's possible that it was more egregious than that. Um, so we have to kind of keep those things into mind, but, but those are some of the early things that I saw as I looked at this case that continued to trouble me. But I keep going back to this idea, Taylor, that there was a triggering moment. And when something like that happens, what a great reminder to all of us that we have to slow down. We have to take a breath. We have to think through what our response is going to be because, if he ran out without adequate money or without his checkbook or without his eyeglasses or a quarter of a tank of gas and he's driving after hours. And, you know, back in those days, there were probably gas stations that weren't open after hours and they certainly weren't the kind you just stick a credit card in and you get a, get a gallon of gas. So those are my initial thoughts. 
Yeah, I agree with you. It seems like there definitely had to have been some kind of a catalyst that caused him to leave so suddenly. And that is a pretty big trip to make out of the blue. Um, I Let's see. Do we know about how far it was from where he was living to Florida? It time? was about a five and a half hour drive. So that's I mean, I thought it's not very, it's not super far, but it's not very close. And what yeah, that's a full of, day though. But, and you know, you yeah. think about five and a half hours with a vehicle that's, you know, 27 years old today. I mean, they probably weren't driving, uh, at real high speeds, although we had freeways in the seventies and above back then. So who knows? For years, there were no leads in James's case, and his family actually faced a lot of frustration and disappointment in their searches. But then, a surprising piece of evidence was discovered almost 25 years after James's disappearance. So, this wallet. In 2020, a woman got in contact with James's family to tell them that she had James's wallet. So, this woman said that her uncle was a truck driver, and he found the wallet at a gas station on I-27 in Bainbridge, Georgia. James's family at first didn't really think anything of this. They thought that there was no way that this could have been his wallet, but she was able to get that wallet to them and they were shocked to find out that it really was his. It had ID cards, family photos, and a few dollars in it. According to James's family, this woman had had this wallet for almost 25 years. So Mike, give me the detective perspective. What do you think about this wallet being found and turned in after all of that time? You know, there are so many unanswered questions on this one. And again, I mean, you answered one of them that I had right off the bat, which was how long did this person hang on to this wallet? And did they hang on to it knowing that it belonged to somebody else? Or was it just in a a, a box, a shoebox of all of her uncle's possessions and she finally worked her way through it? Those are really important questions. And I hope law enforcement followed up and asked those questions because those can tell us a great deal about behavior. I, I, I go back to, to let's go back 25 years earlier when that wallet was discovered by her uncle. Why wasn't it turned in at the gas station when it was recovered? And is there any evidence to suggest exactly where was it found by the gas station? Was it next to the pumps And it fell out of his wallet when he was uh, gassing his car up? Or was it off the edge of the parking lot where maybe he pulled over to sleep for a few minutes? Or where he was robbed? (laughs) I mean, those things are really crazy. So one of the first things I want to do is I'd want to look at the aerial imagery for that location back when it was found. And compare it against all of the historical imagery then and now. But I want to stop right there because my question, I guess, is to you, Taylor, is why is that location so darn important, that gas station? If it was found outside of a gas station, it would have been so easy to just take it into the gas station and say, hey, I found this in the parking lot or next to the parking lot. It is weird to me that they would have held on to it for that long. And I wonder, since her uncle was a truck driver, maybe he just like kind of threw it in a box in his car or I mean in his truck and maybe there was a bunch of stuff that was things he could just kind of piled into the truck. You know how it probably gets kind of messy back there when you're on these long stretches. So my thing is I just would like to know with that gas station, where was it along his route to Florida? Was it somewhere that was kind of out of the way? Was it off the road a ways where nobody else would have seen him there? Um I just feel like that's a really strange thing to hold on to and find in a parking lot and then keep for decades. Yeah, evidence is so important in any of these cases because each piece of evidence geographically can begin to paint a picture, but it can help us understand the behavior of the victim and the perpetrator in these kinds of cases. So again, it becomes really significant the exact location. And I'm going to repeat myself a little bit. Was it next to the gas pump? An accident, it dropped out of his pocket. Easy to explain and understand. Did the uncle pick it up after hours, pulling in and hoping he could get gas and they were closed and there was no place to return the wallet? Or did he take it because he thought he might one day hunt down the owner and return it to him. We can take all these nefarious reasons for why he had it, 
but there could be a whole lot of really um, good reasons why he had that thing. But if this thing is out in the weeds or next to that river that runs by the, that location where, because we don't know exactly which gas station, but it runs right next to a river that I looked at on the map as really intriguing. Did, did it get displaced at the gas station because of the river or a kid picking it up that's fishing on the river? We have to know more about the discovery. And when I read in the media reports that law enforcement kind of brushed them off when they talked about recovering his wallet, I find that really disappointing because there is a lot of information that can be unfolded in that. Now I'm going to throw another question. Why do you think the condition of the wallet would be important? I mean, was this wallet sitting out in the elements before he found it and and uh, was in bad shape? Or was it in pristine shape? Why would that make a difference? I think that could probably help you to determine how he got the wallet. Like you mentioned, if it fell out of his pocket as he was getting gas and it was just sitting on the ground, hadn't been there very long, maybe wasn't very dirty, then we would know that it had been dropped and picked up pretty quickly. But like you mentioned, if it was off kind of in the weeds somewhere near um, like the river or down in the dirt, then it would be have wear and tear from being in the elements. And that could help you figure out how long it had been there. And if it had been sitting there for a while and had been off in the weeds, or if it was picked up and in great condition, that would give you an idea if it was taken from him, possibly by either this person or by someone else, um, or if he just dropped it on the ground. Because I think that, I mean, how I just don't understand how you would like leave knowing that you had your wallet and then you get back in the car and it's just gone. I just can't imagine that he would, I don't know. Yeah, and so as we as we go along that same kind of line of questioning, it, what it does is it also starts to paint a timeline. Was there any receipts in the wallet? Was there anything that would suggest by the condition of the wallet that it was dropped and then picked up and recovered? Or was it taken? Um, those kinds of things become important because then I want to start asking the question, is it possible that this was a trophy of types? Now, Mike, when you say trophy, I know what I think of when you say trophy, but what do you mean a trophy in this situation? Trophies are really interesting when we think about criminal acts, Taylor, because what a trophy really is, is something that gives us an explanation about some of the motivation for the offender. It tells us a little bit about the victim. It helps us to determine whether something like in this case is a crime versus an accident that that in unintentional dropping of it. But in this case, let's just theorize that uh, this man falls victim to somebody who is a serial killer, for instance, that when they dispose of his body and, of course, his vehicle, and that's what really makes this less likely to me, is that both disappear, that they keep something as a memory of the conquest that they've got. They uh, oftentimes will see this with serial killers, with other types of serial predators. They'll take an item from the victim to help them kind of remember the experience. And so that's why we call them trophies. And to better understand this process of trophies, I want you to think a little bit about your own hobbies or interests for a minute. And, And folks, I want you to do the same thing out there. I want you to look around the room where you're watching this video right now. And look at the things that tell a story about you, because we all keep trophies of some kind. For some of us, it might be a photograph. Uh, For you, Taylor, it might be you and your husband at the summit of some huge mountain after a long hike that you've made. Uh, To a sport fisherman, it might be when they stop and take a picture of them with their trophy fish that they caught. And some of these sportsmen will even go as far as having the fish mounted so they can hang it over the fireplace and point to it and say, look at this cool fish that I caught, how big it is. We all have trophies of sorts. I mean, look over my shoulder at, at some of these wacky things on my shoulders. I've got handcuffs from when I retired from law enforcement, uh, a Bobby's helmet from Scotland Yard given to me by one of my profiling students when I was teaching there. All of these are something that kind of tell us a little bit about it. So I'm not, I'm going to expose you a little bit 
tell me some of the trophies that are in your house and tell me why you've kept them. So I, my trophies are not nearly as exciting as the ones that you have. I do keep a lot of like sentimental things. I know I have a a box that I kind of put together that's just, it's almost like a 3D scrapbook of mine and my husband's relationship. So I have like a pressed flower from the first time he brought me flowers at work when we were first dating. And I have um, like a coaster that he wrote a note to me on when he was out of town once that he brought home to me or something. Um, Just little things like that, movie ticket stubs or like travel tickets from when we've gone out of the country, things like that, that I love to be able to actually feel and see and look back on. It just brings up all those memories. So I think it's really interesting and kind of terrifying to me that you have the trophies that you have. I have the trophies that I have, that these bring up amazing, beautiful memories for us. But then on the opposite end of the spectrum, there are people who take things from crime scenes to use for their like pride and joy. And that's one of those things that's so, again, just fascinating and so strange how different humans' brains work. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that, Taylor. And And to everyone out there, think about this, because what we're doing is we're thinking about how if it's a predatory kind of an event that took this man's life, that these are offenders who are in pursuit of legitimate kinds of things, but they're going about it by illegitimate means. And this trophy is a way for them to remember in their whacked out minds this experience, which was for them a conquest of sorts. And uh, and so it really starts to paint a picture. There's got to be a reason this guy hung on to this thing, left the money in it, left the photographs in the wallet for so many years. I hope the reason is because he forgot about it and never got to calling Mr. Tool and telling him, I found your wallet next to the gas pumps. Definitely. It would be interesting to see what other items had been kept wherever this wallet was. If it was just in a forgotten box of things, if there were other items in there, or if this really was just a one-off, I cleaned out the junk in my car and left it in a box and forgot about it. I've done that one before. (laughs) Hey everybody, it's Mike from Profiling Evil. I've been studying criminal behavior for more than 40 years, and one of my favorite research tools is Truthfinder. It's online and you're not going to believe the information stored there. So if you want to know more about that new neighbor, your babysitter, or your next online date, give Truthfinder a try. I'm including a link below with special discount pricing. You got to click the link to get it and then enter EVIL10 at checkout. We're an affiliate, which means we get a small commission, enough to buy a small diet Dr. Pepper, but you can cancel at any time. Thanks for listening today. So Mike, there are so many locations in this case. (laughs) We know that he left Pansy, Alabama and was supposed to be heading to Plant City, Florida. Then the wallet was found in Bainbridge, Georgia. So what does that tell us about his his movements after leaving Pansy? A couple of things that I found really interesting is, is before that wallet was found, law enforcement and volunteers have gone out and searched a number of places that were really intriguing and continue to be intriguing. Uh, Areas like Lake Eufaula to the north. uh, And again, that's been checked already. It was checked before that wallet was found. The wallet was found way to the south of that river or that lake. There's a river that runs from north to south uh, from the bottom or the southern point of Eufaula Reservoir, the name. But the river runs north to south from Three Rivers Lake, and it ends up, though, at the Chattahoochee River. Uh, Now, again, I might have all these mixed up. So people, if you're living in that area, put a note down below and just clarify so that we know and and, uh, uh, forgive us if we've got one of the river names off a little bit. But each of those locations would require that James take a diverted path if he truly was going to Florida. And that's the part that kind of bugs me. I I don't know exactly what evidence they have that caused him to search those areas, but everything we can see would suggest that if he left Pansy and the location where his home was, and possibly more into the center part of Pansy where uh, there is a report he was last seen, I'm pretty confident that he would have taken one of two roadways. Either this road to the south that goes along I-84 and and then goes into State Road 12 and Highway 75 
down past his home on South County Road to the junction. And this is something that was really interesting to me, that junction at Bosemore's Mill Lake. Uh, that junction has a corner that's pretty sharp to the right. If for some reason he overcorrected a little bit or he pulls off the road to explore a little bit, there's a big body of water there that he could have got himself into. Now, again, I don't know the depth of that lake, but I've highlighted those areas that I think are interesting with a red star on this map. I recall reading somewhere that Tool was seen, though, just north of Interstate 84 in Pansy. And so that kind of makes me want to go back and look at traveling this more eastern route down to Plant City, Florida. Uh, that, again, could possibly bring Lake Eufaula back into the picture, but we know that wallet's discovered. So that kind of keeps me thinking, ah, he, we know he made it that far south. Why on earth would he turn around and go back to the north? But here's where things get interesting. I think the fastest route's going to be I-84 between Pansy and Bainbridge, where the wallet's found. Now, there are a couple of places there that really piqued my interest, and I hope Doug will be able to get into these locations and look at them a little closer. <laughs> there is just so much water in the area, and it's such a large area that this is going to be a big challenge for them. Now, we talked about it earlier, but remember, this is like a five-and-a-half-hour drive from his home to, to Plant City, Florida. This is without question a needle in a haystack. It's really easy to understand why law enforcement or Mr. Tool's family haven't been able to locate him in so many years, now closing in on three decades. This is why it was so important that we spend a few minutes talking to James Tool's granddaughter to tell us just a little bit more about her grandfather and the day that he disappeared. So let's just listen to that interview from April of 2022 with his granddaughter for a moment, Taylor, and then I'm going to turn it over to you. So um, James Aaron Tool was my grandfather. He is actually not related to me by blood, but he um, was married to my grandmother, my dad's mother, or my dad's mom. They had been married for a very long time, as long as I think they got married when my dad was probably nine years old. So he had been in my dad's life his whole life, my whole life. Um, he was a great guy, hard worker. He loved his family, um, loved to garden, loved cucumbers. Um, he worked at a little convenience store. He was retired. He did spend some time in the Army, Air Force. That's still a little vague to us. Um, so, yeah, he, he was a good guy. So let's let's go back to the day that he disappeared. We've been trying to theorize a little bit about what may have happened. If we understand everything correctly, he was at work and something happened that caused him to pick up, make an announcement to his wife that he had to run to Florida and head out. Some family in Florida didn't even know that he was going to be coming down. But do you know how that came about? Was it a phone call at work? What happened uh, around that incident? So there's been a couple of stories floating around. The one that we tend to think that is correct is that he received a phone call while he was at work um, from someone in his family stating that his brother was sick and that he needed to get to the Plant City area to visit with his brother. Um, later on, we find out that that call probably never happened. If it did happen, it wasn't from someone in his family directly related to him. Um, so he was at work. Um, I used to get off at the school bus at his house so that I wouldn't be at home alone. His house was directly across the street from the convenience store he worked at. So I would get off the bus there and wait for my older sister to come pick me up. So I got off the school bus the day that day. It was the Monday or so after Mother's Day weekend. So we had all been over there celebrating Mother's Day weekend. And he tells my sister that she needs to make sure she's on time tomorrow because he will not be there. And he doesn't want to leave me home alone. Um, so she says, okay. And he says, he tells us that he is going to visit his brother. His brother's sick. 
And later on that evening, my mother, my sister and I are visiting um, some friends and we pass by his house and he's going the opposite way. So we wave and, you know, kind of just pass by each other on the road. So when you passed him, was he heading north on 75 or south on 75? So he would have been heading north. Okay. On so heading into town. Yep. Heading into Ashford, which is another small town outside of Pansy. We would have been headed towards um, south, towards the Florida um, area. Um, so we passed him. It's a little, it's a little strange that we would see him because, you know, normally he didn't really go anywhere, especially kind of that late in the evening. Um, so later on, we find out that he went to visit my aunt, which is my dad's sister, to tell my other cousin that he was leaving out of town so that everyone kind of knew he was leaving. And then I guess it was maybe a couple of days later, my mom and dad called his sister who he was supposed to be staying with and just wanted to make sure he got, got there. Okay. He had not heard from him. And she's the one that told us that he never arrived. She didn't make the call. His act, actually his brother wasn't even sick. So we don't really know where that story kind of came from, but um, we're thinking that's the only reason he would be heading to Florida, especially in such a hurry. And because he wasn't supposed to drive at night because he had poor eyesight. He would, you know, had glaucoma or whatever. So he wasn't supposed to be driving at night. So the thought that he left that evening boggles us because, you know, it would have been unsafe for him. But we don't know if he left that evening directly after visiting with my aunt or if he left early the next morning. Do you know what time he was visiting with your aunt to give us some kind of a idea of how late it possibly could have been? Yeah, it probably would have been about 6, 630-ish. Which would mean he'd get into Florida by midnight or something if he drove. That's pretty late, though, um, especially with someone, older person with poor eyesight. Um, did, did he uh, wear glasses all the time? I don't think he wore glasses all the time. I think he probably would wear readers, but he had just actually just had surgery um, on his eyes. So I don't think he would wear reading or, you know, glasses all the time, just reading glasses. Now, the, there are a couple of roads that are interesting to get down to Plant City. One would be to go right down 75 straight south past his house and then work his way over to the highway uh, or to go right down I-84 all the way. Um, do you have any thoughts about that one way or another? I mean, one thing that points to I-84 all the way down is that he was last seen north of his home in town and his wallet's discovered on I-84, but we don't know how that wallet ended up there. And we'll talk about that in a minute, but what are your thoughts there? So actually, um, I had my dad years ago draw out the path that he thought he would take. And he tend, he used to usually take the back roads. He didn't like traveling interstate. Um, so that's what he tended to do is to stay sort of back roads. So would that have been then stay on uh, 95 or 75 down to the mill reservoir and make that right hand turn there and. Yeah. And usually he used to go through like the two egg and all those little towns. He would, he would travel that way. Interesting. And, and would that be the case in your dad's memory if he were north of Pansy visiting family first and then heading out of town? Would he still have gone on a country road rather than the freeway? Yeah, he would have. Cause it, where he was travel or where he was visiting their house was probably less than five miles from his house. So it wasn't like a, a very far trek, you know, before he, if he did head out that night or if he waited to the next morning. Was there any kind of, um, th there was clearly disruption in the marriage if grandma would, would leave from time to time and they would be fighting. Was there any alcoholism, any uh, thing around that, that was problematic that you can talk about? Yeah. So he, he did like to drink. Um, and I think that was always a basis of some of their arguments. My granny was very 
um, Christian, you know, she didn't like that a lot. So um, I think that was sort of a reason that they would bicker a lot. But, and I know sometimes when we tell the story, you know, it always gets brought up that that's the issue. But to be honest, this was their relationship and it had been like this for years and they would separate, you know, not legally separate, but they would leave each other for a couple of weeks or months and then they would get back together. And then, so it was just how they were. As you and your family have looked at a map, um, how would you get his wallet to Bainbridge if he took the back roads? The way the whole wallet situation was found is a little um, still confusing to us. So the wallet was found probably a day, not long after he went missing, but the wallet has just recently gotten into my possession. In the wallet, it's exactly like he probably would have had it. So let me ask, how do you know that it was recovered a day or two with in the time frame he would have lost it. So the woman that got um, in touch with us, um, her uncle actually found the wallet at the gas station. Um, and she said that she, he brought it home and said he found this wallet. He didn't know what to do with it. So she took it and said she would try to contact or find and for somehow it just sort of got packed up and she moved a couple of times um nothing was ever done and then she was moving again a couple of years ago 2020 and found it again and then I guess just googled his name and saw you know his Facebook page and then she contacted us that way so theoretically he he could have stopped gassed up it fell out of his wall uh, pocket. He, he didn't get it put in his pocket as he was getting the car going and racing to get further down the road. But then that puts him south of Bainbridge to be lost, which uh, it just increases the challenge for law enforcement. I mean, talk about a needle in a haystack. Yeah. And the, um, and I say the reason I think it was found around the same time was because the girl, the woman that contacted me said she, she could remember about how old she was and she could remember some other, you know, big events in her life that would kind of place her or, you know, place the wallet at about the same time. Um, the other thing is he never, whenever he traveled, he, you know, back then we didn't have debit cards and he had a credit card, which is still in the wallet, but he tended to travel with a large sum of cash the wallet has a little bit of cash in it. And so, you know, which makes me think if someone were to have robbed him, why would they not have taken his credit card, all of his cash, instead of just leaving? And why haven't you had him declared dead after this long? So I tried years ago, and the issue I always ran into was I don't have a death certificate. So credit card companies aren't willing. And even if I don't even know if they would have issue from, you know, information from that long ago, but um, they would never release any information to me because I didn't have a death certificate and I can't get a death certificate because technically he's not been declared dead. So I, it was always some sort of technicality that I always seem to run into. Um, and clearly he hasn't lived to be a hundred years old with a new life somewhere. So, um, so that's really interesting. This is actually, he's a hundred years old now, isn't he? His birthday was December the 5th of 1922. So he would actually have been, or he would be, uh, yeah. Yeah. And, and when he went missing, he had probably three of his siblings were still alive and they helped out as much as they could, but they were older and, you know, didn't really know what to do and how to navigate things. So it kind of got dropped in my sister and I's lap, which we took it and ran with it. And we, I feel like we've done an okay job trying to do as much as we can with what little bit we have. And so now all of his siblings have passed. And so it's kind of like, 
we're in a tight spot because we can't legally declare declare him dead and we're in a spot to where we can't you know I guess we could maybe reach out to some of his like third cousins but I don't know how how that kind of works out in that kind of situation one of the things that I love to do when I look at cases like this is the wallet tells a story of what this person is like would you just as we kind of close up tell a story of your grandpa and do it by talking about each of the items in his wallet as you show them? If I can, I'll try. Um, so this is his wallet. Um, I think some of the damage possibly could have been from being kept in storage for so long, but um, his grandchildren were his life and so he had tons of pictures which that's me um that's my cousins and my sister and their children um that's my sister he had um just you know random business cards of people that he would have been in contact with he had a little bit of cash, not much, in the, in the wallet. He had a credit card, and his driver's license is in here, his health insurance card. So just, you know, kind of, when I guess, whatever he might need on a daily basis. So, yeah. Thank you, Ashley. You uh, you are a beautiful person inside and out, and it's really wonderful to be able to visit with you for a minute. That's okay. I was just going to say thank you guys for the work that you guys do, because this tends to sometimes get thrown under the rug for people, and it's nice to know that there's people out there willing to do the hard work and to put in the time and effort that, that we need. Well, folks, we want to thank Ashley. This is James Tool's granddaughter, the little girl who used to get off the school bus and was always met by her grandfather. And she continues today to look for our grand, her grandfather. And we but hope something really important came from our interview with Ashley in the last couple of minutes. And that is that James tool has never been declared legally dead, nor has he been given a proper burial site. And this is where you, the viewers can come in and really make a difference. We're looking for an attorney who might be able to help this family get through the process to uh, declare J uh, James legally deceased. Now, the guy's 100 years old. Chances are he's gone, but he certainly has matched and met the requirement that the law has to declare someone deceased. The challenge has been getting someone who's in a position that can do that. So if you're an attorney and you're willing to help out, please reach out to us. So I do know that his granddaughters have a Facebook page that they run um, where they post updates once in a while about James's case, and they have done interviews a few times over the years. Um, there haven't been as many updates in the last couple of years, not pretty much since that wallet was found, uh, but they are still pretty active over there, and they're always um, looking for tips and things like that. So I think that's a really good source to have. It's always very helpful when the family does do a Facebook page. It gives us more of an insight into who they were as people and to be able to see photos of them with their families. I think it's a really beautiful way to keep their memory alive because as we've discussed before in these cases, at the end of today, you and I might not go to bed thinking about James, but his family goes to bed every night thinking about him and all of the different people that we've talked about in these different cases. And so I think it's really important to keep those memories alive and keep that search going, even when it feels impossible, because we've seen it done before where a case looks like there are no more leads and it gets solved. So I think it's just a really good way to keep that up. And it's a really beautiful thing for these people to do for their family members. And this is where our viewers come in and help to provide any important information. If you know something about this case, call the Houston County Sheriff's Office immediately and share the information. You can also support James's family and keep up with his case through their Facebook page that's called James Aaron Tool Missing Person. Hey folks, I want to thank Ashley for giving me that little extra email nudge to get back out and tell her grandfather's story. And thanks for AWP for letting us share this ahead of their search. I also want to thank Taylor Nicholas of TGI Crime Day for joining me on the case. And I hope that you will go over to her channel and subscribe. 
Now listen, if you have any information on this missing persons case, the case of James Aaron Toole, please reach out to law enforcement as quickly as possible. And don't forget to enter your comments down below on this case. And don't stop there. Make sure that you're, uh, you're reading other people's comments and, and responding to those so that we can have some dialogue with each other. And folks, again, please hit that like and subscribe button and make sure you're ringing the bell so you're getting all of our videos when they're released. I hope you'll share Profiling Evil with your friends and your family and make sure that you're checking out Profiling Evil on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, and Twitter. You can also have some fun exploring our website at ProfilingEvil.com and make sure that you sign up for our digital newsletter, the BOLO. BOLO means be on the lookout. And we put that thing out a couple of times a year so you're not going to get overwhelmed with stuff and we certainly don't share your information with anybody. So it's safe to give us the email to send you the newsletter to. And I hope you'll consider joining one of our channel memberships. The additional financial support we get from that is really helpful. My favorite, it's the academy level. It's a place where you get up-to-date information a little ahead of everybody else. And here's a special reason why you want to join today. Just last week, I dropped 16 new videos in the academy series that are only available to channel members. Now, for those of you that can't afford to make that jump, don't sweat it. In about May, we'll start releasing those to the general public. So, from London, England, thanks for your support of Profiling Evil. Perhaps we'll have an opportunity to get together again this week. But I think on most evenings, I'm going to be out visiting some of the Jack the Ripper haunts. So, maybe I'll do a live from the streets. Who knows? Anyway, we'll see you soon at the next crime scene.